for having me. Most important, uh, uh, in the introduction, I was on the faculty here at Stanford for 10 years. I just moved to UCSF uh, about three and a half years ago. I still live in Menlo Park, so this is a really easy kind of thing for me. Uh, and uh, all the slides are on SlideShare, so you don't have to take pictures. So the critical ones I'll be tweeting out, so you'll see them at the end. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and I'll, I'll put some of those out there on Twitter. Uh, and I'm definitely leaving at 520, no matter what. You can come up and you can walk with me to the parking garage, because i gotta get, gotta go, got to go get my daughter from the bus stop um, as she's coming home. All right, so uh, I'm a medical doctor. I give me a lecture you know, at the university, so I, I usually got to start with my conflicts of interest. I have just a few. <laughs> so I to say, I've started a couple companies and consult for a whole bunch of companies who might not want to believe another word I say. Over the next 40 minutes, I wouldn't blame you, uh, but I'm most proud of the bottom right. Those are all the companies started by my students. More than half my graduate students now have started companies, even if they go into academia, and they do it with the most amazing platform in the world, which is data. And most of the time it's big data, and most of the time it's open big data. So I'm going to show you how they do it. I'm going to show you how I do it. Maybe I'll convince you this is the most amazing time to be AI, machine learning, and biomedicine right now. This is a glorious time. I will not insult your intelligence to tell you we're in a big data deluge, blah, blah, blah. You see all this, right? I got my start with these nifty gadgets. I could be showing you any of these cool. So I'm going to start molecular and then I'm get into clinical towards the end. I got my start in the molecular world with big data. Uh, and I hate using that phrase, but I'm going to use it no matter what. Uh, I could show you blinky lights. I could show you sequencers. I could show you Moore's law curves. I love showing these little microarrays because this is how I got my start 20 years ago. They were priceless. You put a sample of RNA or cells or biopsy. You get a readout of every gene in the genome. We started with 60 of these back uh, in the late 1990s, they so were priceless. Now they're so cheap, I carry one in every suit. So this is what they look like here. And I love these little chips. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a company called Affymetrix. They used to be down in Santa Clara. Uh, and it's amazing, right? This is how I got my start. We were measuring ge genome after genome for the biology aficionados. Just look at the RNA. Uh, it doesn't matter what it was. It's just amazing me measurements after measurements. And then we get tired of measuring them one, at a one, one by one. And uh, we switched to the 96 well plate format. That's so cheap now, I carry that in my bag. Uh, we got tired of measuring them 96 at a time. We switched to the 384 well plate format. That is so cheap now, I carry that in my bag. I cannot more clearly illustrate exponential growth in biomedical data than to show you these plates. And we don't even use these anymore because we switched to something called RNA-seq. We're using sequencers to make this kind of particular measurement. This company, Affymetrix, doesn't even exist anymore. They got acquired by Thermo Fisher or someone. And this is an amazing time in biomedicine because what do well-funded uh, research groups do? They get a big NIH grant, they go make a ton of measurements, they go write a paper about a few of them, and then they go get another grant to go get more measurements. And we're accumulating all these measurements, right? In the biology labs all over the place, or in the hospitals all over the place. And what happened is, for this particular modality, Everyone started writing papers about this kind of, you know, these lists of genes and these gene chips. Here's a list of genes that change in cancer, and here's a list of genes that change in heart failure, and here's a list of genes, and there's a list of genes that started with the journals. The journals said, you know what, we love these papers, but we're getting too many papers with these gene chips. No more papers with gene chips, that's it. Unless you put this data in an open international repository where all the reviewers can double check the math, and maybe others can use these samples for something else. And the precedent for biology and medicine has always been, if you've got enough people using a molecular modality like this, you've got to share the data. It goes back more than 50 years. And this is how I got my start in, this, in my career, because everyone started sharing all this data like crazy. So I started my career around here, and uh, August of 2012, this paper came out, featured a whole bunch of us at Stanford, when we had one million samples publicly available. That means a million biopsies, a million cell lines, a million mouse models, a million samples publicly available. All to identify, you can't figure out who these people are. But this is the this is the amazing this is the amazing time here, right? Because a lot of times in the CS world, you keep thinking, I'm just waiting for data, I'm stuck, I can't do anything with data. We're drowning in biomolecular data. You just gotta know where to look for this data. And the hardest thing is then what do I ask? What, what's the question I want to ask? The question is the hardest part here. But we're drowning in this kind of data here. So let me just point out a couple quick examples because maybe uh, the rest of the folks are pretty uh, clinical. I saw the, I heard about the rest of the speakers. So let me point out some amazing data sets. Cancer genome app, TCGA. 
14,000 cases of cancer just sitting there waiting for you to machine learn. 39 different kinds of cancer, so all the different head, neck, and lung, and bladder, and 13 types of data, so RNA, DNA, methylation, even images, mammography, brain scans. They give all this data away. Yeah, you got to fill out some paperwork to get to some of this. It's only paperwork. You can get to that. PubChem is another one I love from the drug side. Any of you heard of PubChem? PubChem. Okay, so uh, it's amazing. You can get these cells now, cell lines, to glow, you know, like with some green fluorescent protein, and you can program them to glow if they're living or glow if they're dying. The minute you can get cells to glow, you can shove them in front of robots to test a thousand drugs, a million drugs. But if NIH funded you to do that, you got to share that data in PubChem. Okay, so fast forward, what is PubChem now? Think of a big grid of a quarter billion drugs tested, those are the columns. 1.3 million robotic screens, those are the rows. If you do that math, there are 300 trillion little boxes in this grid, of which a billion of them have been tested. This drug and this screening acid, this drug and this screening acid, okay? Of the billion, 1.2 million of them were active. So the scientists said, oh yeah, this drug is working in this screen. And of the quarter billion substances, 71 million meet something called the Pinsky's Rule of Five. That means you can make an oral drug out of it. It's orally absorbed. I can easily bet you a beer, this beats any pharmaceutical company out there. Okay, in terms of their screen, right? How many robotic screens can a pharma company, ah, hell, I can bet you a bottle of wine. This beats all pharma companies combined. All of this drug screen. Because this is doubling every two to three years, and nothing in the pharma discovery world is doubling every two to three years. Probably every future drug that we're going to be caring about is one of the columns in this grid. And they give this data out to you without a user ID and password. You can literally go SFTP, this whole thing. It might take you a couple weeks. They give it to you without a user ID and password. Right? You should never be a CS student and think you're still waiting for data. There's plenty of data out there, right? The next blockbuster drug is sitting there in a column in this grid waiting for you. It's just sitting there waiting for you to machine learn. Where do you find all these data sets? Where, where do I find all these data sets? Then I'm going to show you what we've been doing with these data sets. If you ever get stuck, like, where do I find data sets? This is a very obscure journal. People ask me this all the time, so that's what I'm telling you. Nucleic Acids Research. It sounds incredibly basic biology. But the January issue of NAR is called the database issue. That is the issue where all, every article there is just on all the open data sets out there in biomedicine. I strongly recommend if you're starving for data for any projects, go to NAR, just go to the January issue. And to give you an idea, the last time I looked, there were 1,600 papers in that one issue, right? Publication, 1,600 papers. All the NIH databases that are out there were two papers, okay? So you got 1,598 other papers explaining these massive open data sets out there. Don't ever think you're just starving for data as a CSU. You've got plenty of data. What you're going to be starving for are the question, what do I do with this data, right? That is the hard part now because you have plenty of data out What are we trying to do with all this data? Well, in the biomedical world, that no one else has mentioned yet, precision medicine is the big buzzword now, right? President Obama mentioned this about uh, three years ago. Uh, Governor Brown mentioned this four years ago, right? We have a whole state initiative, federal initiative. Precision medicine is the future where it means we're going to customize the medical care we're going to deliver to a patient. We're going to customize the medical care based on measurements from the patient, obviously. Obviously, there's some biological measures like DNA, proteins, right? But they're going to be behavioral measurements. They're going to be lifestyle measurements. They're going to be preferences. You know, as a patient, I can tolerate this kind of side effect. I really don't want this kind of side effect, right? We're going to get all that maybe from questionnaires and smartphones and wearables. So we're going to get a bunch of measurements. Some of them are biological. We're going to customize medical care. But you know what? I can't just do it with your measurements. I need those kinds of measurements on a lot of people. And even more importantly, I've got to figure out what medical care did I give to all these people? And what's working and not working? And how do I apply it all to you, right? I can't just do it with your measurements. I've got to know. I've got to have a huge database of just what's been working in medicine and how does it connect to all these measurements, right? That's the hard part. The seminal report for precision medicine was in 2011 from the National Academies. It's a great report. It really outlines what the next 20 years of biomedical research is going to be like. And this is one of the key figures. It's kind of a no-brainer. These are the three challenges of precision medicine. We need better diagnostics. We need better treatments. 
we need to figure out our outcomes, like what's actually working and not working. So all I'm going to do for the rest of my time is give you anecdotes of how we're using all this data to make better diagnostics, make better treatments, figure out all our health outcomes. Okay? And all of this is from the National Academy Report, which I recommend. Let's get to diagnostics first. So what is a diagnostic? A diagnostic is a way for a health professional, a nurse, or a physician to tell if you have a disease or not, right? You might have imaging diagnostics. I know you've been talking about images, medical images, pathology images. You might have blood tests. And so I love protein diagnostics. Some of you might remember, either it's happened to you, or maybe if you're old enough, you have a child. You know, if you have a sore throat and a fever, right? The doctor can stick this Q-tip back there in your throat and put some drops and tell if you have strep throat or not, right? You had that done, right? It's called a rapid strep test. I love those tests. That's called an ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent acid. That's 1970s proteomics technology. I love that stuff. Because it doesn't need a refrigerator, it doesn't need a cold change. That, that test works in a desert. I love making those kinds of tests. But how are you going to tell what to make the drops on? How do you actually tell which proteins to go after? We're going to use all this data, public data, to figure out from the RNA side. If you're a biological uh, aficionado, you know RNA codes for protein. We're going to use it. So I just started, my first big grant when I was at Stanford was go get every human disease studied by these chips. Just go get them all, right? Cancer, heart disease. And we started to collect all the experiments for some of the disease and healthy at the same time. And you subtract them out, you get a, a signature. People have been doing that forever. <coughs> but one of the most important things you're going to realize, and this is going to be one of the themes of the talk here, is that we're so drowning in data that I don't have to trust any one data set anymore. I pick any disease, there are probably hundreds or thousands of people who've already studied it, and I got wisdom of the crowd here. Okay, so I don't have to just pick one data set. There might be thousands of people who made the same experiment from their vantage point, publicly available. And I could use all those natural differences to really figure out what's going on. So the, the main methodology I, I use a lot, besides machine learning, is Venn diagrams, right? What's in common across all these experiments here? So we did that. I did a whole bunch of these, but I'm going to name a couple of diseases in particular. We have to, right after one called preeclampsia. Any of you heard of preeclampsia? Just raise your hand here. Yeah, so very few of you, there's only about 10 of you in the audience. These are the 10 people who watch Downton Abbey because one of the characters dies of this condition. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it. Sybil dies of eclampsia. This is when you're pregnant, you're a woman who's pregnant, and all of a sudden your blood pressure goes shooting high. And if you don't realize that, don't do anything about it. You know, the woman, the, the mom starts seizing, the mom can die, the baby can die. It still happens, it's pretty common. Uh, and what we have to do is take these babies out incredibly early and keep them uh, disease free for months uh, until they're uh, well enough and big enough to go home. Now, there are four drugs already in trials in the United States for preeclampsia, but the diagnostic we're using is ancient. We just look for urine protein. It's not even a specific protein, just is there protein in urine? Probably the most non specific test we have in today's obese America, where a lot of people have protein. So we wanted to make a blood test for preeclampsia. Linda Liu was a grad student. Bruce Ling is still here, if I remember, doing the proteomics. Matt Cooper got involved in a moment, but he got, uh, you'll see in a moment how he got involved. What do you do first? You just type in preeclampsia, preterm birth, prematurity. 266 public experiments where people have already used these kind of gene chips. Here's 299 samples, 249 samples, 154 samples. You pick and choose which one you want. You figure out some quality measures there. Put them all together, figure out what's in common, right? I don't trust any one of these experimenters. I love that they're sharing their data like they're supposed to, but I'm going to figure out what's in common. What do all of these researchers see that's in common? Wisdom of the crowd. You chase it down. Here's one example of a marker, protein marker called hemopexin, up in preeclampsia for a normal, healthy pregnant. Very simple, very simple. Uh, uh, so basically, this is like a uh, uh, a lasso type of supervised machine learning problem. We have a very simple approach here. March is funded as Spark is one of our seed grant programs that we have here at Stanford. And what do you do next year at Stanford? You start a company like this. So this was one of the two StartX companies that I started with, the, with uh, Bruce and uh, Linda and uh, Matt Cooper was the CEO. Uh, we, so we, uh, you're going to see a couple of these arrows. We start with unmet need public data available, got the grant money, uh, Linda helped di uh, design the diagnostic, figured out the, the, the core critical set, you know, lots of variables there. That Spark uh, grant for $50,000 to uh, test samples in the freezer, launched at $2 million, and the science continues in the startup company here. Now, I love this startup company. 
because you can see on the right here, it's already been acquired. <laughs> Some of you know what that means, right? Yeah. So we went from public data, which people still amazingly think is as valueless as kitten videos on YouTube. We went from public data to the acquisition of the company in 24 months. Okay? Inventors happy, investors happy. Of course, we're gonna do more of these, and I'm giving away the secrets here, guys. Okay? Because everyone you can take all this public data, make another diagnostic for a different disease, and we never step on each other's toes. That's how many diagnostics we need next. And literally, this data is just sitting there, waiting for you. Okay? Literally, just waiting for you. All right, that's a diagnostic story. We're going to do more of these. Therapeutics, drugs, way worse. If I were to ask you, if I asked lay people, how much does it cost? How long does it take? How much does it cost to make a new drug? Maybe you've heard it takes a billion dollars in 10 years to make a new drug. Have you heard that phrase, right? Some of you are nodding. Billion dollars in 10 years. A billion dollars is an underestimate. Underestimate. Okay? How do you get the right number? Really simple math, even for this late in the day. Okay, here's the formula. How much did you spend? Divide by how many drugs did you get? Very simple math. What did you spend to buy by how many drugs you get? Uh, Matthew Harper does this every couple years in Forbes. And he puts out this list, and for these top 12 companies, it costs between four billion and 12 billion dollars per drug. Per drug. Kind of not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. We're going to have to come up with more efficient ways to find drugs. Of course, big data, public data, open data, ML, AI, everyone's talking about that. I think an article just came out last night. There are 120 companies now thinking about ML, uh, AI for drug discovery. All sorts of different angles. I know Daphne was already here probably talking about in Citron, many other companies like that here. So, there are, so we started to do our approach here. This while I was still here at Stanford. And as we're collecting all of this disease data, people just started dumping drug data on the internet. Right? This is the Broad Institute and all these great labs that are out, out there testing cells with drug, without drug, with drug, without drug. So on the left, we got with and without disease. On the right, we got with and without drug. And we're going to put these two together. And literally, the reporters for this call this match.com for drugs, literally. Right? Because you got this disease that needs a drug. How do you find a match here? I'm going to show you all the bioinformatics with my arms. If I've got a drug, a disease where this gene goes up and this gene goes down, and I can find a drug now in my catalog that knows how to make this one go down and this one go up, maybe there's a match there. It's as naive as that, finding drugs that reverse the effect of the disease. And you can imagine all the machine learning methods you need, I'll give you this high level, comma, gar, spin off tasks, and pierce correlation coefficients. It doesn't matter, so many ways to do this. It's not hard to do this, which means the harder part now is to try these out in actual mice, okay? Because we're not going to put these into trials, you're going to have to test these predictions in actual preclinical models here. Uh, I want to make sure you guys, you guys get that point. It's super simple now to do the, the computational side of this. The harder part is getting enough kind of courage to actually try this in a mouse. Now, we turned our crank, we had a lot of these drugs, but where we had the most fun aren't the new drugs, it was the new uses for the old drugs, or drug repositioning. And we didn't invent that concept, it goes back 50 years. Everyone knows a famous cardiac drug that had an interesting side effect, and that today is Viagra, right? That started as an angina drug. Of course, Viagra, Minoxidil, and many others. So we turned our crank, okay, here's one, we've done more than a dozen of these in mice now. And almost always we get something that works. Uh, this one just came out last summer. Um, here's a nasty condition called uh, liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer. Liver cancer affects 350,000 people a year, uh, but mostly in India and China, not in the United States. And maybe cause and effect consequences of that, there are basically no companies working on drugs for liver cancer. Right? It's not a US problem, right? This is how it is sometimes. So someone's going to have to make a drug for this, right? Why not us? So we turn our computational cr crank, we get this prediction, nicolosamide. So that's a, that's a drug for worms. If you've got too many worms in your GI tract, or in your pet, you can use nicolosamide for that. Um, the computation prediction says that works. This is a cancer, this is a liver uh, with uh, cancer all over the place going crazy. Nicolosamide is slightly better, but not really better. Nicolosamide ethylolamide, NEN, is a particular salt. You mix with the nicolosamide, you can take this by mouth. You don't even need an injection, it's much better. Glowing cancers, without drug, with drug, you can see some of the mice are much better. And we do have one drug for nicolosamide called sorafenib. 
a nasty drug, doesn't really work that well. So we said, let's try that, the, the mice with both of these. Here's no drug, nicolosamide, serafinib, they're both kind of better than nothing. But combined, they're better than either one separately. So we call that synergy, right? That means the two drugs are probably working in two, two totally different ways. So we're going to run a clinical trial, we're going to put these two, two drugs together. Remember, nicolosamide purely came from computation, doing this kind of match public data, I mean, it's in the publications here. That's cool. Let me show you an even cooler one. This one's not out yet. Again, these are Stanford UCSF collaborations. Peter's still here. He's over at the medical school. Martin is, um, I think he's graduating from his postdoc. This is a disease called psoriasis. Have you heard of psoriasis? Show of hands. Yeah, a couple of you, more of you. Uh, uh, psoriasis is like when your skin gets red and uh, kind of placky and itchy. Uh, it's, a, it's an autoimmune condition against your skin. Your body starts to kind of uh, attack the skin in some ways. And so we, this mouse has been uh, engineered to have psoriasis. Now look, I'm a computational guy. I'm neither a psoriasis guy nor a mouse guy. I don't know. I mean, the hair kind of looks weird compared to this. I can't really see the fingers. I can see the fingers here. This mouse, I guess, has psoriasis, okay? Now here, if you give the same mouse this old drug, this is a 1960s diuretic. In other words, in the 1960s, we used this drug to make you pee. We have much better ways to make you pee in the hospital. We don't use this drug anymore. But this is what we used to do. To get fluid out of you, we used to use this drug. And when you give it orally or topically, uh, the, the mouse is all better with psoriasis, okay, compared to this. Now, you could argue back to me. If you were a biotech company, you would say, why are you trying to find a new drug for psoriasis? They'd love to sell me an anti-IL-1223 monoclonal antibody at $50,000 a year. Why don't you just use that? Immunosuppressive, wipe out the immune system. Of course, the psoriasis gets better, right? Because they have this drug. It's super expensive, monoclonal antibody. You wipe out a good chunk of the immune system, of course, an autoimmune disease gets better. Well, let me just show you the mouse. The cellular DNA, I'm probably the only person I ever show cell pictures in this conference room. I don't know. This is what normal skin looks like in a mouse. The pink are the keratinocytes. It's psoriasis, they go crazy. They don't stay up there, they go deep. That's what makes the skin thicker. Half the dose, double the dose, all the paraphernalia are back to where they're supposed to be. Here. Again, computational prediction that this drug will work. Now, the most important part are all the blue cells here. Those are the immune cells. This is the first small molecule that actually fixes the keratinocytes in psoriasis and is not an immunosuppressant. Nobody has a molecule like this. And it was sitting there in public data a 1960s diuretic. Can I more convince you the value of open data? How many more billion, multi-billion dollar drugs are sitting there as a column in that grid? Sitting there waiting for you. Do not come to me and say you're starving for data. We have plenty of open data waiting for you. You just got to figure out what to target, what, what are the questions to ask. But there's plenty of drug data out there for you to make these kinds of But you've got to go beyond the predictions. You've got to actually try these things. Find a collaborator, find a company to actually test these things in a real mouse, and then do clinical trials. What do you do at Stanford for this? The other startup company we launched called NewMedi, now raised more than $10 million, working on uh, rare diseases, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, all sorts of conditions where nobody has a drug or a working drug. Why not go after some of those rare conditions too? And there are many others. You've heard of in Citro and many others here. I'm loyal to this one because my wife runs this one. All right, so you got a diagnostic story, you got a drug story. Both started with grants, both end up with papers, both end up with companies, right? You gotta get the companies. All right, what's the next big open data? What's my prediction? You know, hockey puck going this way, I'm skating that way, right? The next big open data to me, clinical trials. Okay, you're hearing it now. What's a clinical trial? The most expensive experiment in the world. That's why it's costing us billions to make these drugs. And half of them fail? And when a big clinical trial fails, we don't even write a paper about it, forget about releasing the data? Oh man, is that gonna change? EMA, which is the European FDA, is requiring raw clinical trials data release. Not the summary table we put in clinical trials like that. I mean every patient, every dose, every arm, every encounter, every blood test. The identified, of course, can't tell who these people are. 
FDA might get there, but imagine a world where all these clinical trials data are going to be just released to the public. I'm imagining that world. Either we're going to do patient subsetting, drug repositioning, digital comparative effectiveness, many other things with this data. I run this repository called Import. Go sign up, free accounts. We give out, give out 200 raw trials. I, th I think we're still the only website where we give out raw trials data to the public. Go practice. We set up some R packages to help you get the uh, data in and out of R. And I think I'm betting a lot that the trial's going to be the next video. <coughs> All right. So I love being here at Stanford for 10 years. I just moved three and a half years ago. I still live here in Middle Park, like I said. Uh, and you know, UCSF has grown like crazy. If you ever been to a ball game recently, or uh, you know, the, the science thing we just had a couple weekends ago, we're growing like crazy in Mission Bay. Uh, I'm slumming it out of this brand new building until this brand new building opens in about two years, less than a year, uh, less than two years. Uh, just to orient you here, this is uh, south of the ballpark. This is the Warrior Stadium complex here. Uh, and that's where Chan Zuckerberg is. It's just an amazing time to see just growing like crazy, building a lot of buildings. And I get to run this uh, Baker Computational Sciences Institute. We got our money, uh, our initial launch from a $10 million gift from Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg, so I'm going to show you what we've been spending that money on. Uh, we got this naming gift from the Baker family. Uh, just uh, a couple months ago. And what are we trying to do? Well, we got 50 faculty who were scattered to the winds, just like you were at Stanford. You got folks in computer science, you got folks in medical school, just the same way at UCSF. We're, this is an academic home. We're recruiting faculty like crazy. And these are some of their awards and stuff. We're trying to, this is an academic home. We're trying to uh, get research and development happening, educational plans. Get, make, I want to make sure every UCSF student knows how to write code now. Uh, that's kind of hard to imagine. Uh, but imagine everyone at Stanford learning how to write code, right? It's going to be a minimum now, I think, for every single student in college, grad school, and school to learn how to write code. Uh, and then uh, try to organize these data assets, which I'll end with here. Uh, okay, so we haven't been asleep at the wheel. We know that all this clinical data we have is incredibly valuable, and we're going after a lot of different machine learning and deep learning kind of projects and AI projects. These are just some of the press releases just from UCSF. Uh, UCSF GE, this is almost three years old now where what we realize is we have enough CS folks now at UCSF uh, working on images to come up with interesting kind of uh, pre-product ideas. The partnership with G is on chest x-rays. You know, have you had a bad cough and you got a chest x-ray before? Uh, well, you know, we're not trying to figure out a diagnosis for a chest x-ray. We're picking our questions really in a targeted way. And so here specifically, there's two things that are really easy to miss on a chest x-ray that are extremely high risk. And when a radiologist misses these two things, it's kind of nasty in this room. The first is if you have a collapsed lung, something called pneumothorax. It's kind of obvious when your entire lung is collapsed. You can see that obviously. But if it's really a subtle thing, it's easy to miss. And you don't want to miss that because you've got to treat that. The second is if you're really, really sick in the intensive care unit, they put a tube down your throat to help you breathe. Well, the end of that tube, where, where is the other end of that tube? Kind of important because you're inflating two lungs worth of air. But if that tip is in one of the lungs or the other, that's not so good putting two lungs of air in one lung, right? Obviously. So you gotta know where the tip of that thing is, then. That's called an ET tube. So two very specific questions. They did all the deep learning, we had all the images, we had all the, uh, the clinical data, we knew there were folks at UCSF who already got that code working. And we partnered with GE to co-develop that, and that, tech, that code, that tech now is gonna be part of the new portable x-ray unit. So in the next year or two or three when GE gets around, if, G if GE is around in two or three years, let's hope for that. But uh, uh, those machines that they'll be selling for portable x-rays uh, will be uh, uh, actually uh, having this kind of thing built in there. GE is not doing so well if you have those. Uh, we partnered with Intel on neuromorphic chips. That's their NVIDIA. Of course, everyone's partnered with NVIDIA. And of course, we partnered with Google. I know Jeff Dean's already spoken here. I'm not going to tell you about it because he probably gave a better talk about our paper than, than I would give you. But that's basically predicting patients that come into the hospital, are they going to die during the admission? If they get discharged, are they going to come back unexpectedly? Stuff like that that we can do with just the raw data. But there are so many other companies out there, right? And I know everyone here wants to start a company too, but I wouldn't be surprised. It's in, the, it's in the water here at Stanford. Uh, I know, I used to drink the water too. Uh, this is an old graphic, I think almost three years old. The, three years ago, there were 106 startups transforming healthcare with AI. If you think this graphic today, they probably have thousands of companies. And that's probably just kind of Bay Area companies. There are just so many startups here. I'm going to give you some advice at the end. But there's just too many in some ways. That we, it's really tough for all these startups to come talk to health systems like Stanford and UCSF as a first customer. It's really tough now. 
I get two or three companies every week just wanting to get to our data, wanting to try to sell me something, uh, and it's getting hard. So I'll give some advice towards the end. All right, so now that's UCSF. And I love UCSF, and it's great, and they got a new building, and I get to recruit faculty. But the real reason I love Stanford was because it was just moved to UCSF. They taught me about something even bigger. So, you know, I know the cattle Stanford thing with football, right? But I never really knew what UC really was until I moved there. So the University of California actually has 10 campuses. Six of them are medical, and four of them are not medical. It's like Berkeley, Santa Cruz are not medical. UCSF Medical, UCLA, Irvine, Davis, San Diego, Riverside, those are our six medical schools. And if you look at it, we also have the three national labs, three supercomputer centers. We've got uh, 200,000 employees. Actually, we're one of the larger employers in the United States. I have a quarter million students a year. I got the six medical schools. We train a whole bunch of docs who actually practice, which makes you think, like, you know, if we teach them about data in medical school now, they're going to be amazing docs when they get out. Uh, a lot of funding, and they're not lousy medical schools either. We're some of the best in the United States here. And so what they, what they brought me in to do was to help get all the data from all of the medical enterprises together in one place, okay? A central data warehouse for all clinical data for the entire University of California health system, right? So I wouldn't be a CS guy if I didn't show boxes pointing to boxes. So here's my box pointing to boxes. UCSF, UCLA, Irvine, San Diego, Riverside, UC Davis. All six of those now have EPIC as an electronic health record system. So does Stanford, so does Louisville Patrick. We love it or hate it, it doesn't matter at this point. And all of them, uh, Epic has really taken over the world in a kind of not so good way, but it doesn't matter. They already won that battle. But we got all this data now, all feeding into a central health data warehouse. Now look, there's a national narrative out there that it's so hard to get health systems to share data, and everyone says it's a tech problem. We don't have standards, whatever. That's so wrong, okay? It's really, really easy to get, get health systems to share with each other when you have a business reason to do it. Okay, and we have a business reason to do it. Right? We've had academics wanting to share data for a long time. We kind of made some progress, a lot of good progress. But the minute we now decided two years ago that the entire University of California is going to make single, a single accountable care organization, something called an ACO. Right? It's like an HMO, but even beyond an ACO. We're going to have a single ACO aspirationally five or ten years from now, right? But we're going to have something called UC Health, where in the future, it's not like you're going to UCSF or UCLA, you're going to go to UC Health. And the minute you've made that business decision, it's so much easier to share the data. Because all of a sudden you've got to figure out, well, how do we practice medicine? Well, at UCSF, we take care of transplant patients this way. You take care of them that way in UCLA. That's kind of weird. Or San Diego, you take care of colon cancer patients this way, and we do it this way, and we're kind of weird. Right? The minute you've decided you're going to be one big organization, you've got to figure out how you're practicing medicine together, and you've got to put all that data in one place to start to compare. So it's much easier to share data when you have a business reason to do it. The corollary to that is if there is no business reason to share data, it is almost infinitely hard to share data. Right? Because you can write all the code you want, the CEOs are not going to want to share data if they're competitors, right? It's not a code problem, right? It's because you want to share data, it becomes easier. All right, so where are we now, right? So the University of California, we've got the six medical schools here. We have a total of 15 million patients in our system, at least with some diagnoses, some meds, some birth date, some MRN, uh, first name, last name. So that's 5% of the U.S. population. 5% like of the U.S. population has gotten some care in the University of California. This is probably one of the larger data sets that's out there. Here are some of the numbers here. We're using OMA. So, so show of hands, have you heard of OMA? Boy, who's been giving you guys lectures here? You better learn OMA. Okay, this is the vendor neutral way to store patient data. Okay, we're not going to pay any more money to Epic or Cerner or all the rest. Health systems that are organizing their clinical data, we're going to use OMA. Okay, even Google, when they sell health system stuff, they put OMA. Everyone's moving to OMOP. I strongly recommend, if you're going to get into this any further, learn about OMOP. Because it means we don't have to pay another dime to Epic. We've paid enough. Uh, we've got five, more than five illustrations of modern data, quarter billion medications we've ordered, half a billion vital signs like pulse and respiratory rate, half a billion diagnosis codes, half a billion blood test results. Huge numbers, right? Huge numbers, and that's what it's going to take to teach computers about medicine. Yeah, we've got dashboards and stuff we're making. All right, this is proof that it works, just geocoding where all the patients live. UCSF, UCLA, uh, UCSF, UC Davis, UCLA, UC Irvine, UC San Diego. Riverside is super tiny. It's a brand new medical school. They got like a thousand patients compared to the rest of the world. 
things, right? Okay, so that's proof it works. Here's proof that we actually have measurements on these folks. Uh, LDL is one of your lipids. When you get older, you gotta measure your lipids and go on statins if your lipids are out of control. Uh, now, I'm not a cardiologist, but lipids are supposed to be under 200. So here are 2.2 million LDL measurements across the entire EC system. A million of them are good, a million of them are not so good, okay? So the folks uh, around our system with an LDL of 600, 200 is the cutoff, and above that, we really want to treat. So there's a whole bunch of folks with this genetic condition called familial hypercholesterolemia. And now we can make sure at a top central level that they're on the right drugs. All right, what are we gonna do with all this clinical data? Lots of ideas here. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, let's skip that one. All right, let's get to some real world examples here. Okay, so I'm actually an endocrinologist. That means I have to hear a lot of patients, especially kids with diabetes. And if you think about diabetes, it's a world health plague right now. A third of kids are gonna get type two diabetes. A bunch of adults have type two diabetes, adult onset diabetes. This is what the American Diabetes Association says you're supposed to do to treat patients with diabetes. This is how a lot of medicine aspires to, is to have a nice fancy pastel diagram like this. We have plenty of diseases where we have no such diagram, so we're lucky to have a diagram. It's pastel colors, it's like made for California, okay? Now, how do you read this diagram? It's what docs do. Try to lose weight, exercise. Yeah, try that first. When that fails, go to metformin. When that fails, add in one of these six drugs. When those fail, add the other five drugs. When that whole thing fails, go to metformin and insulin at the bottom. So this is like a pachinko machine, if you know what I mean, like the ball goes to capacity, right? That's kind of interesting. So you got these six boxes in the middle here, and we're kind of curious, well, which ones do the doctors actually choose, right? It says, well, it depends on a variety of patient and disease-specific factors. In other words, it gives you no real help. And it's super important today, because some of these boxes cost 200 times more than some of these other boxes. <coughs> but they're all in the equal size, or all the same kind of pastel -y colors. You would never know that, okay? But some of these are super expensive compared to some of these others. So a simple, stupid question we asked was, what do our actual doctors do? Right? What did they do at UCSF? Which ball, how does the ball fall through the Pachinko machine here? All right, so this is work by Tom Peterson, and you might have seen some of these graphics before, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, so we used to call these diabetes donuts, but that would be inappropriate for diabetes. <laughs> so now we call these lifesavers, okay? And, and I think of this like a pie chart, and pie also is inappropriate for diabetes. But there are 12,007 type 2 diabetes patients here. It's like a pie chart. So a third of them, what's the first drug we use? A third of them are in metformin. Okay, good, that was at the top. A third of them are in insulin. That's kind of weird. Okay, a smaller group are on sulfonylurea, so that's okay, I guess. The, the purple one here, DPP40, that's a very expensive way to start people. And the slices get smaller and smaller. 12,000 patients here in this ring. And the black ones here mean there are so many little slices there, I can't even show you. Now, I've been practicing medicine for a while. I'm, barely, I'm not really practicing anymore, but I've studied this now for a long time. I'm starting to realize more and more medicine is like playing a game, okay? And I'll, I'm not saying playing a game like to belittle having a disease. It's rotten to have a disease. But a lot of medicine works like a turn-by-turn -turn game. We make a move, and then we wait to see what does the patient do, or what does the disease do, and then we make another move. It's a very move-based game, actually, if you think about it. Right, so if you're in the hospital, the doctor comes in the morning, writes some orders, they wait to see how you're doing, they come back the next morning, they write some orders. Or if you go to a clinic, they say, okay, here's some prescriptions, come back in 30 days or 90 days, we'll see how you're doing, we make some more, right? It's turn by turn. And so here, we've made a move now in this virtual game. We send the patient home, they come back in 90 days, here's the next move. Okay, so everyone here, that one move was perfect. We've seen them back, we've never had to tweak the dose of metformin. Yellow and yellow means they're still on metformin, but we had to tweak the dose a little bit. And any other color switch means we added a drug, changed a drug, subtracted a drug, right? We have to do something more than just change the dose. Okay, we send them home, we come back in 90 days, and here's the next move. We send them home, we come back, and here's the fourth move. So here are four moves out in this game. 1,600 different ways to treat type 2 diabetes. And you see something, just count how many spokes there are here. We have 1,600 different ways to treat diabetes. Probably too many. Can we get that down to like 500, maybe one? Right, maybe 10, I don't know if we can get down to one. But this is 
an unnecessary and ridiculously expensive practice variation. And now we want to start to compare the strategies against each other, right? And if I can do this for one campus, oh, I can do this with all the campuses here, right? So here are all 71,000 patients now, all campuses, and we have 6,500 different ways to do this. Right? It seems it works when you add the other four campuses. Probably too much unnecessary practice variation, but this is medicine today, okay? We're not all following one set of rules here. Now remember, I said this is like a game, right? And so some of you know how we teach computers how to play games, right? We have way before deep learning, right? You can just do move trees, you can start to search strategies, right? This is literally how games, I mean, Go is a lot harder, but checkers, chess, you can solve with just simple decision trees, just model out what move, I make this move, the computer makes this move, I make this move, and the computer can figure that out going far into the future. I start to think of medicine the same way. If we make this move, what's the patient likely to do and the disease likely to do, what's the next move, what's the next move? I think we can learn how to play this game from all this data we have. And here's a simple example of that. Remember those yellows, right? Half of the people with yellow did fine, half we had to do something else with. Can we like learn that pattern? Man, you don't even need deep learning for this. It's a simple decision tree. If your blood test the hemoglobin A1C, it's what we measure for diabetics, was ever more than 8.8, you're in the red. If you're fasting sugar, that's the first test we do to see if you have diabetes, was ever more than 206, you're in the red. Don't even bother starting the metformin. We know it's gonna fail. We've seen it again and again and again in the University of California, 70,000 patients. What was the next move you're gonna make? Make it today. Get this patient to therapy 90 days sooner, right? At least. So we are moving from this expert-driven world, right? And believe me, the rest of medicine is still trying to aspire to the expert-driven world, to a data-driven world, where we've tried all these strategies, empirically we can see what's working. It's amazing, African-Americans do better this way, Asians do better this way. We can learn this from 70,000 patients with diabetes. Now imagine this for every decision in all of medicine. That's what we're going to try to do, okay? All right, so precision medical practice. The doctor of the future is going to say, I need a drug for patient with diabetes, rank order one, two, three, simulated forward. This is where it's going to actually work, What's not going to work here. All right, I'm going to end with this concept here of maps. What am I trying to do? I'm going to uh, make maps of death and disease. Somebody needs Google Maps, right? I know if you're on campus, you don't really need Google Maps, right? But the rest of you, if you want to get off campus, you need Google Maps. Some of you use Waze. Few of you use Apple Maps. I'm stuck using Apple Maps in my car, but you know, there's still it's actually getting better. So you understand the concept of maps, right? So usually you use Apple and you use Google Maps as they to take you to a pleasant destination. I'm trying to make a map from the data of how you get diseases and die in the state of California. The opposite of Google Maps. Okay? So here's data from real California data. You can get this off the internet, discharge data. What we've learned, Hannah and Jay did this. Patients show up with alcoholism, they start on this map. A year after that, they have liver disease or cirrhosis. A year after that, they have liver abscess, so it becomes straight down here. And the squares mean you can die of those conditions. So we have a lot of patients showing up with alcoholism. It's really hard to die of alcoholism. It's much easier to die of these conditions, right? They become this way or that way. Each arrow is a year. All right, here's a more complicated map. Patients showing up with heart attacks. You can die right away. Everyone kind of understands what a heart attack is. Or a year later, we end up with heart failure. That means a heart as a pump is too weak. It's not going to be able to pump the blood the body needs. So you can die right away. The fluid backs up into the lung, call, causing lung disease. And then you die in three years of sepsis, body-wide bacterial infection. Nasty diagnosis code to have. 50% mortality rate in the United States if you have this diagnosis code. Okay? Now look, I'm a pediatrician. Didn't really see a lot of patients with heart attacks. I always thought if you had a heart attack, it was the heart that killed you in the end. And indeed, it's not the heart, it's three years later, it's the sepsis, it's the infection that kills you. I didn't really realize that. I don't really think we're looking for sepsis in a lot of heart failure patients, right? And if you don't take the northern route, you can take the southern route, kill your kidneys, and end up with sepsis a year earlier. So that's why you have two arrows. So we're gonna build these maps. We're gonna learn where you are and what might happen next. But you know, as pretty as these maps are, we don't wanna just make the maps, we gotta see where the patients are actually on the map, and that's what we're planning to do. Here's a real prototype with real California data as patients are getting older, the colors get brighter, and this is literally how patients move from disease to disease to disease to death. A whole bunch of 
bunch of them are going to get sepsis there in a moment and die. There they go. <laughs> Everyone chuckles, don't worry. And now we can start to predict what's going to happen in the next 90 days, what's going to happen next year, and what are we going to do about it. And that, to me, is going to be a new definition for an accountable care organization, one that knows how to account for the care of each one of its 15 million patients. That is what we're building with all of this tech in the University of California. All right, so too many other data sets to talk about. Too little time left. I'm going to end with this one slide here. I'm tweeting it out, so don't worry. You don't have to uh, write this down. Machine learning lessons I've learned in healthcare the last 20 years. <coughs> Get the question right. Okay? Don't come with the plan. Get the question right. Solve the problems that healthcare professionals actually need solved. Okay? And don't just ask one doctor, ask two, okay? Because there are plenty of kind of docs who want something solved. Get, get from two people that day. It's actually a good problem to solve. Building a great diagnostic is very different than understanding the biology. Again, I'm going to go down to the tech for a second here. You might know about lasso and variables and what the tightest possible way to predict something, yes or no, right or wrong. That's great, that's a really simple diagnostic, but when you're surveying the biology and looking at what's going on, you want all the variables, not just the last so it's one percent. Biologists and medical professionals love explanations over black boxes. Something to think about in today's deep learning world. People talk about alchemy here and all that, and it's, you know what I mean there. But we, we love the explanations, not just saying, yeah, it's gonna work. Watch out for input limiting models in medicine. Patients barely type in the right codes for their symptoms. And they barely enter their own race and ethnicity. Thirty percent of patients show up in the emergency room here or at UCSF. They don't even tell us their race and ethnicity. Forget about entering more than that. And docs, forget about trying to ask them to enter more. Okay? They will just shoot you if you say spend another two minutes with that. Okay? So watch out if your model needs more input. Watch out. Learn what IRB, HIPAA, BAA, ICD-10, CPT, CLIA, and CAP are. Okay? You gotta walk in knowing what those vocabulary words are and learn patience. Because it takes us time to warm up and to trust you, okay? Because this is sensitive data, we have a lot of damages against us. If there's a breach, we got to learn to trust you. Not all of us are cloud allergic. Don't come to say well, you have X working now with the cloud version of X. We're priority thinking about that. Okay, cloud is not a big deal for us anymore. Not everything needs deep learning. Having all data on everyone is super rare. Like you just don't get genomics and images and longitudinal EHR data on everyone. There may be like 100,000 patients in the country with all of that. Data integration and harmonization can happen if there's a business reason for it. I already told you that. A trillion dollars is spent on Medicare and Medicaid, especially Medicare, those are older people. Think whether your parents would use it, okay? You know what you're trying to build. You're trying to sell something. <coughs> Think if your parents would use it. That's a trillion dollars spent every year on Medicare. Platforms and the companies are just getting more and more commoditized. We have plenty of people, grad students, who graduate saying, yeah, I got Spark working, I got the loop working, I want to do this for you, right? Come to us with more medical knowledge and background, right? We, we tend to teach, take with more respect those folks who know something about biomedicine too, right? Can't convince us you care about this as a vertical. Show us we're going to learn more from you than we're going to have to teach you, right? If you come to us not knowing what these blood tests are, what these images are, Man, it's a really short conversation. We're not even going to open the door, right? Because we're going to have to teach you a lot more about medicine. Because the first 500 things you're going to find are stuff we already know in this, right? We want you to go through those and give us 500 and front of number one, right, that nobody realized. And healthcare inefficiency is not about friction. And let me just end with that one concept here. Right? It's so easy to run an engineering quad here, right? You look at medicine, you think, oh my God, what an archaic system. You think of you know these gears that are rusted, like, oh my gosh, if I just add some oil, everything will just turn so efficiently. Friction is the wrong model to think about healthcare. It's not friction, it's resistance. Okay? We do not want to change the system here. Right? Nobody in our system today is burning money on the front lawn, right? It's someone is making every dollar in the system of the $3.2 trillion system. Nobody's burning money, right? So if you're talking about changes, it's gonna be shuffling money, taking money away from people who are earning that money today. Be ready for fights. Pick the side you're gonna be on and realize who your fights are gonna be against. You cannot, if you think it's all kumbaya, I'm gonna make everything great in healthcare, you're not gonna go very far. 
right? It's about struggles for those dollars right now. And so, yeah, tug of war, of course, get these off the internet. And in general, these are the three kind of sides of the triangle. You got pharma, biotechs, and devices over here. Healthcare providers at like Stanford, UCSF, and Kaiser here. And payers and uh, uh, pharmacy benefit man uh, managers over here. Strangely missing are patients and businesses who you think care the most, but are the most underrepresented, okay? So these are three that are driving here. Not one of the three, technically, wants the game to end, right? Point to which one of these wants us to spend less in healthcare. Right? It's not gonna happen. You're gonna, what happens is two of these are always ganging up on one. These two against one, these two against one. Pick the side you're gonna be on against another side and help that side figure out what they can do to be more efficient. You cannot make the whole system more efficient because everyone's earning those dollars to them. Let me just stop end there. Ah, uh, let me skip over. All right, I gotta thank a lot of people who make this day where as possible. A lot of collaborators here at UCSF and Stanford and NIH. I have to thank a whole bunch of folks who give us money here to get us uh, some of this work. So let me just stop there and take some questions.